Good morning. Um, Brother Mark is coming back from vacation today, and I know that when he gets back, he'll be re-energized and renewed, and we will all benefit from that. But as I was getting ready for um, this sermon a few weeks ago, knowing that he would be out, um, I started to pray and seek the Lord for uh, what I wanted to preach on, or what he wanted me to preach on, I should rephrase there. Um, And I felt like the Lord was telling me to preach about Jesus and the paralytic man and his friends lowering him through the roof. And I said, started to pray, God, I said, if this is not what you want me to preach on, please give me a clear sign. And so Brother Mark preached on it two weeks ago. And so I said, God, I think that's as clear as it can be. And so um, with that being said, God led me to something else. And so we're going to be talking uh, about the power of many. If you remember last week, Brother Mark talked about the power of one, talking about one sin can keep you away from Christ if you let it. And today we're going to be talking about what it means to be in community. So I ask if you bow your heads and pray with me, please. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the ability to gather together as believers. And Lord, uh, we pray for those in this room that may be seeking something, that maybe they aren't believers yet, and they're looking for something. They're looking for you, Lord. I pray that they'll realize that they need you today. Lord, as we open your word, we know that you, your, promise, your word promises us that it doesn't return void, Lord. I pray that these are not my words that are spoken, but yours. And that we know that promise will hold true, that when we read out your word together, that it doesn't return void. And I'm so thankful for that. I pray that as we talk about community, Lord, that you'll stir up our love and affections for one another. And that we'll continue to love each other. And maybe we can even do so in some ways that we haven't thought about before. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So... We're going to talk about the importance of being in community today, what God's Word has to say about that. Um, I think we as humans know and understand and have a desire to be in community most of the time, but we see the power of community not just in the human world, but in the natural world as well. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about an animal, meerkats. They live in community together and how they function. And so I think we have a picture of meerkats in case you're unfamiliar All right. Um, Well, that's Timon, probably the most famous meerkat of all. Um, But let's see a real picture, a real meerkat. So meerkats are in the mongoose family. They live in groups of up to, from as low as three to up to 50. And a group of meerkats is called a mob. It's unclear whether meerkats um, have a godfather or not, but they are called a mob. That's a bad joke. So I appreciate the people that are laughing at it. But these meerkats and all meerkats, they live together, they work together in communities for their group to survive, for them to enjoy life together. So what will happen, a few different things happen, how they live. Um, Adults will take turns on guard, on watch for predators. They have lots of predators that could, um, would take them away and kill them and try to eat them. They watch out for hawks and eagles. They watch out for jackals. They watch out for other animals like that. And so an adult will keep watch and the rest of the group will take out and they'll go hunting and foraging for food. And it doesn't matter uh, when there's baby meerkats around. It doesn't matter whether it's their offspring or someone else in the group. They will teach the, baby, the other meerkats. They'll teach them how to find food, how to hunt, how to do those things. And that person that's on guard, they'll swap out that uh, animal on guard, that meerkat on guard for about every hour so they can go out and hunt and forage for food as well. So they survive and they thrive being together in a community. They have to do that to live, to function, to be a part of a community, to grow and to survive. And so they know the power of community. They understand it. Of course, there's lots of animals that have to do the same thing. I just happen to pick out meerkats for us today. But I understand the power of community, and you probably do as well. Community deeply impacted and still does shapes my faith to this day. But when I was in high school and started following the Lord, taking my walk with the Lord seriously, um, part of the reason that, that I was able to do that and, uh, was because of two guys that were my age that were taking their faith seriously as well. Their names were Parker and Luke. They were in my youth group, and they encouraged me, and we encouraged each other to continue following after the Lord. 
It doesn't matter what generation you're in. If you're a high school guy following the Lord seriously, it's hard to find other high school guys that are interested in following the Lord and taking that seriously. And so I was lucky to have found those. They affected my faith in a way um, that, that other people couldn't. But as I grew with them and as I grew in, the, grew in the youth group at the time and grew with my whole church, that community deeply impacted my faith and is part of the reason that I'm here today. None of us were perfect. We all had our struggles and our faults, and we hurt each other sometimes accidentally or on purpose. You know, you know how that is. And so, but they pushed me to follow Christ. They had always pointed back to Christ. It always pointed back to following Him and taking my faith seriously. I think we all probably in this room have that positive impact of community on our life whether it's at this church or whether it's a group of Christian friends that meet outside of this church um, where you come together and you're able to grow in Christ because you, you want to help each other, you want to grow in your walk with Christ. And I think all of us have come to the realization of how important community is because of COVID, right? It was taken away from us. Uh, we didn't expect it. We didn't know what was happening. And I think all of us now we realize how important it is to be together, to spend time together as followers of Christ, um, encouraging each other, equipping each other to do good works. And so I know now that we don't take it for granted like we used to because it was taken away from us for a while and it was frustrating, it was upsetting, and we thought it was the best thing to do. But with that being said, if you'll turn in your Bibles with me, we'll start in Genesis 1. We're going to talk about community, about what God's Word has to say about it. And what better place than to start in the beginning? So, Genesis 1, 26. Jesus, uh, God says this, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So we see in the creation story, God says, Let us make man in our own image of course, he's talking about the Trinity there. God is three in one, Father, Spirit, Son. And so, if we are, as humans are made in the image of God, then it's obvious that we would need a sense of community, that community would be something important for us. And so, in fact, we see that God's Word says the first thing that was not good in creation was someone being alone. Genesis 2, 18 says that. Then the Lord God said... It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Of course, we know these verses are referring to Eve and talking about marriage for Adam and Eve. But we also know that God's Word says that not everyone is called to be married, right? We see that in the New Testament. And so, He commands, God commands us to be in community. And God's plan has always been for us to be in community Together, And there are a lot of benefits from being in community, as we all know. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12, if you'll turn there with me, that's kind of our anchor verses today. And so these verses, you may have heard them at weddings or things like that. Sometimes they're used at weddings. Um, but this is actually talking about friendship here. And so I know some of you may have just got out of a lesson out of Ecclesiastes from your uh, Sunday school if you're doing Explore the Bible curriculum. So let me read that for us. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. So these verses are talking about some of the dangers that people would face traveling in the biblical times. We know that um, traveling alone especially was very dangerous during those times for a number of reasons that are listed out. Um, a, a few things that could happen to someone traveling. They could fall into a pit or ravine. We know that the roads weren't very stable. There's a lot of um, wilderness terrain going from town to town. There were cold nights. If they were not able to make it to a town, had to sleep outside or sleep under some type of lean-to or covering, it could get very cold in that climate very quickly. And so without someone to help warm, it would be um, very cold and could lead to death. 
And the third is robbers. They never knew what was around the next turn or they're in a mountainous region. Maybe somebody was above them watching the road, waiting for them. And so when people were together, when people were in community traveling, they were much safer in that time. And so those were all things that traveling people at that time had to worry about. These things could happen to them very easily and very quickly. And so these just show us some benefits of being in community. And if you remember Ecclesiastes or if you've studied anything, there's kind of a catchphrase there depending on the translation. It says everything is futile, everything is vanity, um, depending on the translation that you prefer. And in fact, we find that about 40 times throughout Ecclesiastes where he just says everything is vanity, everything is futile, there's nothing good or whatever it is that he says. We kind of know and we course that requires some context too as well but you notice in these verses the writer of Ecclesiastes he doesn't say that community is unimportant he doesn't say community is vanity or futile community is always important there's always progress there's always importance in community and we know this too but if we look at the life of Jesus right Jesus was constantly with people. He had his disciples that he was closest to were constantly there helping him. He constantly was eating meals with people, um, people that the Pharisees sometimes looked down on. Sometimes he ate with Pharisees or talked to Pharisees. And so Jesus was always in community. And so I want to point out something about Jesus' 12 disciples, if you'll let me, in Mark chapter 3, 16 through 19. And so... Jesus is appointing the twelve here. And so I'm just going to read this out for us. And he appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James. To them he gave the name Bonerges, which means sons of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So we've got a few, a lot of, a lot of people here that are um, have a lot of different backgrounds, as, as some we know about, some we don't know about. But something I'd like to point out is it talks about Matthew here. Other places he may be named as Levi, depending on what translation you have. We know that Matthew was a tax collector. Um, I know most of us in this room are not very fond of the IRS, um, but a tax collector in that day and time was much worse, much, looked down, much more looked down upon than the IRS is today for a number of reasons. The first is that this person was collecting taxes for the Roman government. Israel had been overtaken by Rome, and so Roman government would hire someone that was a local to that area, and they would have them take, uh, take taxes from the people around them. So the first thing is that someone was a tax collector at that time. Other Israelites felt like they had betrayed their country, that they were a traitor. So they were already looked down upon because of that. The other thing is the Roman taxes were extremely high. Um, it's estimated it could be anywhere between 80 and 90 percent. And we just thought the IRS was bad, right? <laughs> Luckily, we aren't living under Roman rule. And, but we know that tax collectors would, um, they had the authority to take money for themselves on the top of that, and they had a, uh, an army to enforce that behind them, so people really couldn't say, no, that's not right, that's not fair. Um, otherwise, the Roman army would come and make sure that they, that they paid those um, taxes that they had. And so, we have this tax collector that Jesus calls that's the lowest of the low, that's the outcast in society. If you remember, the Pharisees would say, Jesus eats with sinners and tax collectors. They're their own special group of sinners. They're the worst of the worst. So Jesus calls him. But then he calls a man named Simon the Zealot. You may know what a zealot, uh, what they were at that time, if you've watched The Chosen. If you haven't watched The Chosen, I would highly recommend it to you. It is some of the best Christian media that I've ever seen. Um, it's completely free. You can find it on the App Store and on YouTube. It's an amazing show about Jesus and his disciples. Um, but the Zealots, they were a political group at that time. And so what they wanted to do, they wanted to overthrow the Roman government. And they wanted all the Israelites in that area to rise up and start a resistance against Rome. And we know that a lot of uh, Jewish people did not do that. 
Um, and so what they would have to do is they were a small group, and so what they would do is they would kind of do these little kind of guerrilla warfare type tactics on Rome or anybody that was associated with Rome. So if they could kill a Roman guard, if they could kill a Roman authority, if they could kill a tax collector, they would do those things. They would set up little missions and try to hurt Rome that way. Do you see the dilemma here? Jesus has called a tax collector and a zealot. Two people on the opposite ends, complete opposite ends of the spectrum. I don't even think there's anything comparable to compare one end of the spectrum to another in our current day and time. They're much further apart than any groups that I can think of, one on the far right or far left, whatever your leaning is. Jesus brings people together that otherwise have nothing in common and would have been enemies. Isn't that the power of the gospel? That Jesus brought people together, people that had nothing in common, people that would have hated each other before that, that he brings them together and he brings them under his banner and now they have a connection. And that connection supersedes anything before them. It supersedes race, it supersedes socioeconomic classes, it supersedes countries. It is the most important thing, whether you're following Christ or not. That is the most important thing. And he brings those people together as families. It's very possible that before this, before Jesus called Simon and Matthew, that Simon or some of Simon's friends could have tried to kill Matthew if they had the opportunity. But together, they're brought together, they learn from Jesus, and after that they go and turn the world upside down. Because they were faithful with God's missions, we sit here today and talk about God and pray and get to fellowship together and go out and change the world like they did. And so the things that divided them, they fall away when they started following Jesus and they become family. And Galatians 3.28 tells us that about those things that divide us, those labels that we have, labels that society puts on us or labels that we give ourselves. It says, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free man, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul writes to the church of Galatians, said, these things that are dividing you, these things that people put you to, to stop talking to another person or not to associate with other people, it doesn't matter. You are together under Jesus. And that's the most important thing that could happen is you're following Jesus. You are together. Now we are all in common because of that if you are following Jesus. And so that brings a lot of benefits, a lot of benefits for us under following Jesus. What are the benefits of community? And so that's something I'm going to talk about. John Mark Comer says there's two purposes for community, a community that follows Jesus. One is exposure and the second is encouragement. Exposure is the one that a lot of us try to avoid. And some of us have trouble with community because of this. We have this thought in the back of our mind that if they know what I've done, they wouldn't talk to me anymore. They wouldn't spend time with me. If they know the thoughts that I have, they wouldn't want to be around me. And can I just say that the enemy would love for you to be stuck there to avoid community because he whispers, he says, if they really knew you, they would run away. If they really knew you, they wouldn't want any part of you. Because exposure can be hard, but exposure shows us what is really there in our lives. When we come around other Christians or we're willing to talk to them about what's really going on in our life, moving past the superficial, hey, how are you? I'm doing great. Every week you're doing great, right? On Sunday morning, <laughs> something's got to give, right? It's not always great. We've got to be willing to move past that topical, that it's okay, everything's great. I have to pretend that everything's together on Sunday morning, even though my life is falling apart the other six days of a week. We have to move past that. We have to be honest and open and real with each other for us to get to have growth. So what happens is when things are exposed, when we have those difficult conversations with each other, healing happens. Exposure under Christ is not to make you feel bad. It's not to shame you. 
is for you to confess and be healed and to move past it. Satan would love for you to struggle with that one thing over and over again for the rest of your life and never move past it because you're too afraid to tell somebody else. God's Word says in James 5.16 says this, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. After exposure comes encouragement. So conversation may look a little bit like this sometimes with someone that you've opened up to and you've talked to them about and that you have a good relationship with, that you've been in community with for a while. They may say something like this. They say, mate, yes, you've messed up in this area. You've fallen short in this area. But I've seen God working in your life and I've seen you come so far. I've seen God grow you in this way and in that way. And a year ago, this thing would have never even bothered you. This sin that you were struggling with, you would have never even worried about it. But now God is bringing it up, and that's a sign of growth for you. And I'm here to help you and encourage you. That's what it looks like. And we're commanded to encourage people as well. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. God tells us to meet together and encourage one another. And if you have this conversation where you think, hey, I don't know if I need to tell them this. I don't know if I need to encourage them in this. Um, Truett Cathy has a quote that says, how do we know someone needs encouragement? They're breathing. So um, I, I believe that is true. We all need encouragement. And of course, we all bring our baggage along with us, the things that we're not willing to talk about yet or the things that have hurt us and been going down. And a lot of times we don't even know that about the other people. And so when we say something very quick, hey, I enjoyed your Sunday school lesson today. Or, hey, thank you for helping out with this. It really helped me out a lot. Those things go a lot for, those few words go a lot further than we realize. Here's the thing it's really hard to encourage someone if you don't know them very well. So, this is why I've enjoyed D Group so much um, this year on Sunday nights, and I hope you consider being in one as that opportunity arises for you in the future. We get together, we talk about God's Word in a small group. Um, we talk about the good things that happen in our week and the bad things that happen in our week. And we pray for each other and we encourage each other. So my hope is, is that if you're not involved in community in some way, if you're not involved in Sunday school, not involved in a D group, or if you don't meet with a group outside of that at some point, um, maybe you have a Bible study that's not attached to the church, that is great. If you're not a part of one of those things, I would encourage you to find community somehow in some way. God's Word is clear about what we're supposed to do. And that, that is this. If one thing that I'd ask you to remember this week is this. You can't follow Jesus alone. If you're trying to, if you feel like you can... That's a lie from the enemy. The enemy wants you to be isolated. The enemy wants you to be alone. The, the Bible says that Satan's a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. If you watch any nature shows, you know that lions and other predators, they isolate their prey. If you're isolated right now, you are an easy target. But a cord of three strands, a cord of five strands, a cord of ten strands... 20, 30, 100, however big your community is, it's not easily broken. And my hope is, is that you'll be a part of that and that we'll be able to love each other, care each other, encourage each other to push on. Um, I'm going to pray for us. I'm going to ask um, Brother Tommy to lead us in invitation and Jordan and I will be down at the front if you'd like to talk to us. The altar is open. Well, let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for today. I thank you for the opportunity to open up your word. And I thank you for this community that loves and cares for me. Lord, that was not always the case in the churches that I've been at. And so this church holds a special place in my heart because of that. And I pray that anyone that is seeking a home would be willing to give us a chance 
and they can see the love and affection that I have received here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our